universe. Life is antagonistic to the natural state. Our purpose is to correct that mistake. Every one of the Legion Vast that just swept aside your defenses in one night was once like you. Take the Lord Marshal's offer and bow. I bow to no man. Look, I'm not with everyone here, but I will take a piece of him. Are you familiar to me? You think I'd remember? You think I would too? Pitch Black introduced the world to Richard B. Riddick, a nice cold killer and criminal that can see in the dark. And we've covered the film a while back in a video I'll be leaving a link to below. At the same time, it launched the career of Vin Diesel into stardom, an actor who'd only voiced the Iron Giant and played secondary characters in films like Saving Private Ryan, The Boiler Room, and Strays. As Riddick, Diesel dominated the screen with an easy coolness that ensured his work in action blockbusters, and in the four years that followed, would star in The Fast and the Furious, Knock Around Guys, Triple X, and one of my personal favourites, A Man Apart. In June of 2003, David Toy and Vin Diesel reunited for the next chapter of the Riddick mythos. David would write and direct a story focusing on a universal threat and Riddick's lineage, while Scott Krupp and Vin Diesel would produce the mammoth feature. The universal threat that intersects with Riddick's journey are the Necromongers, a large religious empire that fervently pushed their necroism belief system on others, essentially the notion that life was in conflict with the natural state of the universe. This zealous empire went through the cosmos on a terrifying crusade. They believed that life was antagonistic to the natural order of the universe, and so had to be purged to enable rebirth in the Underverse, their promised land and the ultimate source of all their powers. Necromonger. It is the name that will convert or kill every last human life. Their leader Xylor, the Lord Marshal, had gone to the Underverse and gained superhuman abilities, derived from the manipulation of his astral body before emerging as a half-dead. Using shock and awe, he overwhelmed each world before converting or killing the entire populace. He would then release conquest icons, large energy delivery systems that devastated entire planets, eradicating all signs of life and ideologies that challenged the Empire. Their religious doctrine, incredibly large numbers, advanced weaponry, and their ability to teleport from their ships en masse make the Necromongers one of the most terrifying threats to life imaginable. Xylo had also come across a prophecy many years ago that foretold of a Furian that would bring about his downfall, and so went on a campaign to convert and wipe out the entire race of Furians. This prophecy eventually culminated into his tactic of culture annihilation, but unfortunately for the Lord Marshal, there was one Furian that survived the extermination of his people. We pick up with Riddick in the year 2583, who spent the past few years avoiding capture on desolate planets. A four-man crew for me? Insulting. After killing an entire squad of mercenaries led by his nemesis Tombs, he steals their ship and travels to Helion Prime, aiming to eliminate whoever placed the bounty on his head. It's here that he encounters a vision of a Furian telling him to confront his past. Some of us still remember the true crime that happened here on Furia. And once you wake, you'll remember too. Going to the city of New Mecca, he meets up with Keith David's Imam, who he'd previously saved in Pitch Black, along with the young girl Jack. I told one man where I might go. Were it not for the threat of invasion, I never would have betrayed you. As Imam shares his concerns about a threat coming from beyond the stars to conquer the surrounding planets, Riddick shows his signature cold indifference. It's all circling the drain, the whole universe. Right. That's right. Had done sometime. Arion the Air Elemental soon arrives, explaining her bounty was to seek the help of his Furian lineage. He appears to not care about his home planet, and also has no interest in fighting the Necromongers at first. Not my fight. But his feelings begin to change when he sees their invasion firsthand, with the warriors quickly bringing the city to its knees and killing Imam. The Necromonger's high priest, called the Purifier, gathers the remaining citizens of New Mecca to convert them, when Riddick drops in and takes revenge on his friend's killer. After a fast and efficient victory, the Lord Marshal takes an interest in him, stating that the warrior he killed was one of his best. If you say so. Giving Riddick the fallen warrior's knife, he explains, In our faith, you keep what you kill. A philosophy in which ending another's life entitles you to their property and position, inadvertently sealing his inevitable fate. When a scan of Riddick by the quasi-dead reveals him to be a survivor of the Furian genocide, his execution is demanded and he escapes only to fall into the hands of tombs. 
The crew decide to take him to the Crematoria prison, located on a planet so close to its sun that its surface is scorched, making escape practically impossible. However, this is all part of Riddick's plan to rescue Jack, now going as Kira, who's imprisoned there. Riddick is dropped in and quickly acclimates by demonstrating he is most certainly the Alpha. <laughs> After word reaches the prison guards that Tombs and his bounty hunters stole Riddick from the Necromongers, who are no doubt on their way, chaos erupts in the control room and the guards left make their way to the remaining ship via the tunnels. At the same time, Riddick and several prisoners brave the planet's surface to beat them to it. Unfortunately, the Necromongers led by Varko arrive, killing most of them and capturing Kira before leaving Riddick for dead. All seems lost until the Purifier shows up to save him. While we don't notice it at the time, he was also the one that had released him from the quasi-dead during his interrogation. The Purifier shamefully reveals that he too is a Furian and encourages Riddick to bring Xylor's cruelty to an end before walking out onto the surface. Taking Tombs' ship, Riddick flies back to Helion Prime to rescue Kira, and when she's mortally wounded by the Lord Marshal, he goes super Furian, but is unable to overcome his inhuman speed. That is until a power-hungry Varko, stepping in to take the throne for himself, inadvertently gives Riddick the edge he needed. With everyone he'd ever known dead, Riddick collapses on the throne, keeping what he has killed, as the Necromongers kneel before their new ruler. As always, Diesel shines as Riddick, the kind of guy that can kill you with his teacup. What's that? I'll kill you with my teacup. Unlike Pitch Black, the sequel isn't a horror film in so much as it is an action adventure with more complexity, a bigger cast, detailed costumes, production sets, large-scale battles, and a solid soundtrack. The flying menace of the Bioraptors has been replaced by the aura of the Necromunga space fleet, and there's a nice shot of them breaking off the mothership that harkens back to the Bioraptors emerging from their home planet in Pitch Black. There's depth to the universe building that was pleasantly surprising, and a sense of humor that helps the film not take itself too seriously. When the ride's over, your goggles are mine. Judy Dench, Com Fuhr, Carl Urban, and Thandie Newton all chew up every scene they're in like they're having the time of their life. Kira's character is also once again central to the humanizing of Riddick, and the juxtapositioning of him being crowned the Lord Marshal after he loses the only other person he cared about was bittersweet, making us wonder if he would now lose himself to absolute power. It should be noted that during its rating process, it was given a hard R rating for violence and language, but Universal really wanted a PG-13 rating to reach a wider audience, so they appealed the initial rating. After being denied, they butchered the film, and several scenes were either edited down or cut out entirely for the theatrical release. Thankfully, a director's cut was made with all of that content restored. I highly recommend you check that version out, and it's that cut that we're discussing today. I knew the trap the other sequels had fallen into. I think the key to it is not to do the expected. Don't meet the same creatures. Don't even let it be a creature movie. Could we change genres and yet keep the same tone and keep the same characters? Despite all the amazing work, the theatrical cut, which makes very little sense, was a commercial failure, and Universal made the decision to never make another sequel. The ever-persistent Vin Diesel had a brilliant solution. He would star in a cameo to promote their Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift in exchange for the rights to the Riddick franchise. And so, within 10 years, Diesel would revisit the series in a film simply titled Riddick. Instead of the grand scale of the Chronicles of Riddick, it was more restrained and in line with the original. Vin Diesel repeatedly insists that a fourth film is in development, so I'll close this by saying that I've enjoyed the three main films, the video game Escape from Witcher Bay, and even the animated short film, and I'm always ready for more. A huge thanks to everyone who requested we explore the Chronicles of Riddick. If there's anything else you guys would like me to cover, please let me know in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.